Good morning and happy Sabbath, Woodside Church family. Today is Friday, September 24, and I'm recording this for September 25, Sabbath, and we will be having communion on that day, and we bow your heads, we'll be having communion tomorrow. At the end of the third quarter, we'll be getting our fourth quarter. In October, we have John Bertiver speaking on October 9, and then October 15 and 23, we have Pastor Steve Case coming to present Revelation 102 at Woodside beginning Friday, October 5th, uh, 15th, and then going um, for the Sabbath morning, and then each night uh, concluding with the Sabbath service on October 23. And uh, we hope that you'll be able to come and invite a friend to join us for that. We will be having indoor COVID policies of masking and we still have a long way to go in this pandemic to get into a place where we feel like we put it behind us. But God is there. He's carrying us through it. And I hope that he's nearby to you, especially today. Will you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your amazing grace. And as we open your word today to discover salvation, rescue, and relief, we ask for you to inspire us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand amazing truth that is compelled by your love we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves it is your gift dear lord and we pray for that wisdom to energize us today in jesus name we ask amen today's sermon is part four of a five-part series called the five s's or otherwise known as the pillars of seventh-day adventist doctrine we, as a denomination, have relevance and something to offer the world of Christianity. We have a view of Christ and of God that must be presented to the world in a way that is magnetic. And our scripture reading for today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. And I'm reading here from the New American Standard Version. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom, did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for a son, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul helps us to know that the summary of the gospel is in Christ crucified. And I have a different scripture reading there. I added two verses to my reading for today. But when the message of hope given to the world in the gospel is centered on Christ, it is full. It is complete. It is the Knowledge necessary for salvation. Because Paul said that he wanted to boast in nothing but the cross. And my intention today is to point out that the cross and its action provides for us the salvation that is ultimate. You see, the world and its derivatives and, and what Paul points out here as Jews and Greeks and debaters of this age and wisdom and that their idea of salvation is markedly short of the biblical idea of salvation you see here in the picture we have a rescue effort underway we have a material salvation being affected here someone is lost someone is in distress someone is off the path they're in harm's way. They are subject to the elements 
maybe harmed by another person, harmed by a wild animal. But the line between the helicopter and the rescuer is secure by the saviors, in this case, the rescue team, the Coast Guard, or whoever is manning this rescue helicopter. And so our worldly view of rescue is limited by our focus on the material. And the prophetic mandate within scripture is to point out idolatry wherever it is. And I would point to you that in our 21st century, materialistic idolatry skews our understanding of what salvation is in the Bible. You see, Ellen White writes this in the book of education, and we have uh, a clear gift and a, a clear commentary here. Right from the very foundation of the world, we were shown in Genesis through Moses, we were shown that there were two trees. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And these trees were in a particular part of the world. They were in the place where man was posted, in a portion of the land of Eden, in the garden of Eden. God's wisdom in placing those two trees within the scope and the reach of humanity's dwelling provides us insight into how we lost salvation. You see, it was a material thing that caused the ultimate loss. Ellen White writes in the book Education, and particularly verses, uh, excuse me, pages 301 and 302, and follow me along here, and then I'll show you a diagram how we compare this to the wisdom of the world and the biblical understanding of salvation. You see, between the school established in Eden, beginning quote here, between the school established in Eden, at the beginning of the school of the hereafter, there lies the whole compass of this world's history. The history of human transgression and suffering, of divine sacrifice, and of victory over death and sin. Not all the conditions of that first school of Eden will be found in the school of the future life. No tree of knowledge of good and evil will afford opportunity for temptation. No tempter is there. No possibility of wrong. Every character has withstood the testing of evil, and none are longer susceptible to its power. To him that overcometh, Christ says, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 7, you see the giving of the tree of life in Eden was conditional and it was finally withdrawn. But the gifts of the future life are absolute and eternal. Adam and Eve materially lost access to the tree of life. That tree of life is the material salvation that we need. That tree of life will be available to us and the ultimate rescue plan. Now watch here this chart, and I've put it on the screen here, and I want to elaborate on this because it is a table that Paul would have left in his description of the wisdom of the wise and God making it foolishness. You see, we have these spectrum of religions. We have the concept of God, which is adopted by various religions. We have a view of humanity also. And at the core is humanity's primary problem. And the solution that the variety of religions offer is different than the biblical view of Christ and him crucified. You see, and that will affect what each religion provides as the afterlife. And even in this table, which I took from a book of comparative world religions, there are... Uh, Downfalls. There are there are fallacies in, in the biblical. You see, monotheism is what we've adopted as worldwide view or a biblical view of the Bible. And in First Corinthians eleven twenty three and twenty six, Paul elaborates on this when he points to communion as the bridge between Eden and the paradise of God. In monotheism, we have one transcendent God involving three individual persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Competing dualism is two opposing gods. Polytheism approaches it with many gods. Balancing dualism is 
these two interacting forces. And monism is an impersonal oneness. Atheism suggests that there's no God. And thus, therefore, i.e., our humanity, as we go down on the side of atheism here, there's, there's a complex form of matter. In other, in other views, humanity is just this material object. In monism, humanity is caught in the illusion of separateness, but identical in essence of, to the oneness, which suggests confusion and division on all sides. In the balancing dualism, you have a microcosm of the two forces. This can be seen in what we see happening within Islam and the Muslim world, the microcosm of two forces. They have pitted nations against one another because of their idea of the dualism. Now they propose that they are monotheists, but they have a slanted view of the enemy of God or the jinn. In Islam, there is still opportunity for the devil to regain his position. And that's in their primary texts. It's a very, very challenging idea of um, salvation. In polytheism, you see the gods can be influenced and even possessed. Humanity can even be influenced and possessed by the spirits. Now that, uh, it, it elevates the fallen angels to the position of deity. And it's a really strong position in the majority of the third world because of the animism and the ancestral worship that they have. In competing dualism, there is this view that humanity is made to battle evil. And it's a real challenge. And in monotheism, which we have adopted to a large part, Humanity is part of creation, but we have a level above the animals. And there are faults that break down there. See, in the biblical view of humanity, we are created in the image of God, the very image of God. And that image of God has been corrupted by sin and death. You see, humanity's primary problem, going back to the monotheism and charting across the table here, the, the main problem with humanity is that we have broken God's law. We are in rebellion against God. And the main problem is failing to seek God's guidance and not living up to the image of God that has been created in us. Humanity's primary problem across the spectrum can be choosing to do evil or angering the gods or living out of harmony with the ways of nature. Ignorance of one's innate divinity is also proposed. Now, atheism proposes that our problem is superstition and irrational thinking, which they would lump faith in with that. Now, the solution for an atheistic or a scientistic or whatever modern is ism that you would take would simply to rationally think your way to the solution. Yet, <laughs> the afterlife and atheism is still non-existent. So how is that any solution at all? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In monism, salvation and the solution comes in realizing that our essence is the same as the oneness. In other words, it's enlightenment, which has its problems. Because you are either reincarnated to lose one's individuality, you, and you're merged into this oneness in which salvation just is non-existence at the same time. And so you can see how the solution and the afterlife are merged when you consider these alternative scopes of looking at salvation. When you're in balancing dualism, you're living in harmony with the ways of nature, yet nature itself is corrupted in the biblical worldview. Polytheism is simply the cycle of appeasing the gods and hoping that they are accepting your piety. In competing dualism, you're choosing to do right, which if the view of humanity is simply that we are made to battle evil, it holds up. But in the biblical view, we are powerless in ourselves to gain salvation outside of a gift from God. You see, the solution within 
monotheistic biblical worldview as being justified before God, Romans 5.1, living according to God's law and seeking his guidance, yet it still falls short of the ultimate salvation, which is in the afterlife. And we went through grave concerns when we talked about death and how even understanding and adopting a biblical identity of death helps us to understand the ultimate salvation. And the ultimate salvation is what Jesus talks about when he tells us in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit for they, theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed be those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle or the meek for they shall inherit the earth. This is Matthew 5 and following. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And I'll read through 10 and verse 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you. Incredible thing about the Beatitudes is it is an advancing line in the Christian experience. That's Ellen White and the uh, Thoughts from the Nun of Blessing. She writes that the Beatitudes are an advancing line in the Christian experience. In other words, it flips materialism on its head and it proposes that the ultimate salvation will come when we are persecuted for Jesus' sake. When we have understood we are poor in spirit, we start our journey down that path. When we mourn for that delinquency of soul, we are comforted. When that mourning leads to meekness and gentleness, we shall receive mercy. When we constantly hunger and thirst after righteousness, not the dark things of life, not the things that lead us to death, but for hunger and thirsting for righteousness, Christ promises that we shall be satisfied on the journey to salvation. When we are filled with righteousness, we show mercy to the merciless, and we in ourselves receive mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ, and that mercy compels us to make peace within our sphere within our influence. The New Testament says, if so far as it is possible, live in peace. Irene, the Greek word, live in peace with all men. So far as it is possible, it is impossible in this world. And that's why the conditional subjective is given there. We are to make peace and in turn to be called the sons of God. Jesus is the son of God and he was a prince of peace. And the angels foretold that his coming would bring peace and goodwill to all men. Listen, we can ascend to being peacemakers and called sons of God, and that will lead to persecution for righteousness sake. You can be persecuted, but it can be for your own stubbornness. You can be persecuted, because, but it can become because you have taken a position that is irrational. When you're persecuted for Christ's sake, you are compelled by love and you will take that persecution on this chin because you know that the prophets went through it before you. You know that they hated Jesus and tore out his beard and whipped his back and scourged him and put a crown of thorns upon his head and say to him, prophesy who hit you. When you can take that persecution with humility, like Jesus says, you are on the advancing line towards the Christian experience. Roman, or, sorry, Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Ye are amiss if we look for the ultimate reward in this life. You see, we are preparing the Lord's table. We are preparing the emblems of Christ's sacrifice. And I'm going to go back because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul and the New Testament church were uh, adopting what 
Christ told them to in the Old Testament. I'll read it here for you. In verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from you from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This incredible salvation of which I speak and this incredible wisdom just found in the scriptures which contain the knowledge necessary for salvation according to our doctrine of the Bible. We proclaim his death until he comes. We build a bridge. Communion is a bridge between the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his second coming. It's called an everlasting covenant. And Paul says this in Ephesians 3, 14 through 17. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you be rooted and grounded in love. And it goes on to talk about, you, you may be able to understand the, the depth and the height and the width of the love of God. You see, when we're rooted and grounded in love, we understand the love of God, which compels us. And that root and that grounding can be illustrated by a banana tree. You see, you can chop a banana tree down. You can assault it with the storm. You can pick its fruit and you can knock it down. And unbelievable as it seems, no fire or two typhoon can kill it. Even if one cuts its body into a thousand pieces, it still can survive. The only way by which a banana tree can be prevented from going in is to uproot it completely. And no one can take that from you. No one can uproot that salvation. That's why when Jesus says, those who are called my, my name, no one can take them from me. When we are uprooted in the, when we are, sorry, when we are rooted in the salvation of Jesus, no one can separate us from that ultimate salvation. Isn't that incredible? The love of God compels us. The love of God constrains us to help us understand that we can be trees ourselves that bear fruits in keeping with repentance, according to the apostle John the Baptist. And so I propose to you, and I long to tell you, Jesus is Lord and Savior over all. Jesus bears our guilt and our shame, not just for penal atonement, not just for substitutionary atonement, not just for moral influence either. But the Bible is clear that he became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'd like to propose to you a reading from this book, The Future of Adventism, and the chapter on salvation written by Gary Chartier, the, the editor of the book, he concludes by this. And he proposes that within Adventism, when we have a clear picture of Christ, we can present a clear picture of salvation for the world. But if our Christology is muddled, and if you're confused about who Christ is, we cannot present a clear picture of Christ to the world. In other, in other words, if we have raised these five pillars and we say all you need to know is these things in order to be saved, we're not presenting a complete picture of Christ. And so he writes this, an attractive Adventist Christology and soteriology, another word for saying the study of salvation, an attractive Adventist Christology and soteriology would focus, I believe, on love. This means that they would emphasize the importance of freedom with consequences for how we think about God's presence and activity in Jesus, how we think about God's self-communication and how we think about the nature and extent, extent of God's saving activity and our role in facilitating it. That's the church's role, facilitating a work of God and his saving activity. He goes on. Such a Christology, 
astrology and soteriology might build on an account of divine action as fully persuasive, or they might build on a mixed account of divine action. Either way, however, they would need to take seriously the fact that a credible account of div divine action must begin with the recognition that God's will is frequently not done. God's love frequently not realized in the world. Thus, if we want to say that God is love, then we must affirm as well, I think, that there are serious moral and metaphysical constraints on the realization of God's will in the world. In turn, taking these constraints seriously means thinking carefully about divine action and in light of what we conclude about divine action, thinking carefully about what we say about Jesus and salvation. Here's the last part. That God is truly with us is the most powerful and reassuring belief to which we can give voice. Our ongoing existence as a community of faith will be justified only to the extent that this belief forms the center of our mission, our proclamation, and our corporate life. God is love. And he intends for us to display that love to the world, to present a clear picture of Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself up for us. Incredible thing about the gospel is that Jesus came down and he, in his incarnation, shows to us what eternal ultimate salvation will be an eternity with him, with access to the tree of life, living in the paradise of God. Is that your desire today, friends? It can be available to you through his word. He proclaimed it and he accomplished it for his glory. So we bow our heads in a word of prayer. Loving God in heaven, we turn to you today as the ultimate savior. This material world cannot separate us from your ultimate salvation. We thank you for the prophetic call that you gave to us to flee from idolatry because every wrong picture of Christ is an idol that we have set up. And every legalistic monolith that we have placed in the shadow or, or, or to eclipse Jesus is wrong. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us for, for, presented a, for presenting a perverted picture of our high priest. Reveal yourself through us, O oh Lord. Make your scriptures come alive. We ask these things in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen and hallelujah. God bless you, Woodside Church family.